We're really honored to have Che on here with us today. And I'm very honored, you know, my, myself and Trisha have known Che and his wife for many years. We've traveled together to China. Uh, and I believe it was 2011, we were over there teaching for the Wagner Leadership Institute. And uh, Che on took over for Peter Wagner with the Wagner Leadership Institute and is now accredited. Uh, so that takes a while to get that done. He's an apostle. I don't know how many thousands of ministries and churches are under, under his care right now. But it's thousands. I'm probably ten, over ten thousand. You know, if it took time to add them all up, and and that's a gift. That's that's a spiritual gift to be an apostle, to be able to uh, be able to plan and execute big visions, and we're part of that. Uh, this church is part of that. It's like an East Coast post for uh, the apostolic and prophetic movement, and we're really happy about that. So um, I'm not going to give a big introduction, but this was a very uh, a notable quote that he had. He's from California, very liberal state, just like we live in a very liberal state. And when the, when the state just overstepped their boundaries, they sued the state. And they said, no, sorry, you're, you're violating our rights, our constitutional rights. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they won. It takes courage. It takes courage to be a Christian. And when, when the governor was saying that churches were not an essential business, this was a quote from Che. We've been essential for 2,000 years. And I would, I would encourage you to read the, the verdict, that's not the right word, the, the, the ruling in the Supreme Court case. And uh, Judge Gorsuch said, uh, California is no longer a church-free zone. <laughs> They're gonna be allowed to meet again. And uh, you know the rules were so, so lopsided in favor of all the, the Hollywood movie studios were allowed to shoot and they were allowed to go to sports events. And, and the way he worded it was, so you're telling me in this cavernous building, you can't have one person in, in a church that might hold 5,000 people. He said, no, that's not gonna happen. Reopen again, and they reopened, amen? So would you welcome Che on as he comes? Honored to have him here. Thank you, you may be seated. It's an honor to be back. And King of Kings Church, and uh, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., so it's good to be back uh, on the East Coast. My uh, wife was born in New York City, Doctors Hospital, and she grew up in Cherry Hill and then moved down to Maryland, and that's how we met. Uh, but I tell you, you have awesome pastors. I love Peter and Trish Roselli. And, um, you know, there really is one holy Catholic apostolic church. And when I say Catholic, I mean universal. That word literally means universal. So there's only one church. And it's been amazing how he's bringing his church together. Different streams are coming together. And your pastors are part of HIM. And one of the things we believe in uh, our network called Harvest International Ministry, that if this benefits you, you should be involved with different apostolic networks so that it will help your church, help you as a leader. And so they joined uh, HIM a number of years ago, but we have yet to commission them. And so this weekend we talked about them coming out uh, at our annual global summit. It's our once a year conference. And of course it was locked down last year, but we had it this year. And, uh, and it was always right after Easter. And so we're gonna commission your pastor, Peter as an apostle, Trish as a prophet. Um, and so it's a good excuse to come out to Los Angeles and be with us and see our beautiful building. We bought this beautiful building in 2004. By the way, you've done a magnificent job. I like this building better. I don't know why. It just seems, just seems cozier, and there's no pillars. There's no blockage. You can see uh, the front everywhere uh, you sit. So every seat is a good seat. See people in the balcony, and I'm sure people are watching online. Uh, and so welcome. We love you. And uh, it's such an honor to be back here. How many of you never heard me speak before? Because I know things have changed over uh, the months and years. Okay, there's a good, uh, maybe around 10, 15%, which is great because I can tell my old jokes and be brand new for you guys. And so, so we'll keep things fun. And, but uh, I've been uh, just amazed at God's goodness as we're singing that song. I, I never heard that song before. A number of the songs I haven't heard, but of course, some of the songs we, we sing as well. But um, but just about uh, loving him with all of our heart yeah. and, uh, and just experiencing his goodness. 
And, and I, I want to just say that uh, it just a few months ago, May 25th, I celebrated my 48th spiritual birthday. I got saved. I got saved. This is um, it's a long story. I don't have time to go through it. But just in a nutshell, I had an encounter with Jesus Christ in um, 1973. And uh, I was just, I was into Eastern religion. I was into Zen Buddhism. I rejected Christianity. My dad was a Southern Baptist pastor. Uh, but I just rejected everything that he believed in because I grew up in a very abusive situation. Even though my dad was a pastor, he had a violent temper. And, uh, and of course, I was so rebellious myself, and I deserved a lot of the abuse. But in the sense of uh, the punishment that he's trying to, uh, you know, he believed in uh, uh, the Board of Education on the seat of learning, let me put it that way. And, he, and so, um, so I left home at the age of 17 because of that. It wasn't because I got busted for drugs, even though I was a drug dealer, drug pusher. And it was during this time I was searching, I was dropping acid to go on these uh, spiritual trips. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you came out of that background. And, um, and so one night I was at my friend's house and I was going through my Zen chant, saying this stupid, no, nonsensical chant, but definitely demonic. And I'm saying this incessantly. Uh, every opportunity I would have, I would say this chant. And then I sat down on, in, in a lotus position. I'm going through this chant and I was chanting for like five minutes and I said to myself, I've been doing this for one year and this is the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I honestly said that. I got nothing out of it. I think it was my parents praying for me because it is demonic, there's real power, but it was just shielding me from influencing my life. Uh, because my parents didn't know what to do but just pray. And they were prayer warriors and they prayed me into the kingdom. So I, I cried out to God and, and I, this is what I said. I said, God, I don't even know if you exist. So I was like an agnostic, not, not an atheist, I believe, but I wasn't sure. But if you are real, if what my parents told me as a little boy is true, that there's a heaven and a hell, and that Jesus is the way to eternal life. I mean, they shared the gospel with me, it just never registered. But I said, if this is true, I just want to know the truth, because I was on this spiritual journey. And I said, if you're real, just reveal yourself. I mean, if you're God, if you create this universe, just you can reveal yourself to me. And... Um, and I was really saying, just show me in the days ahead. I didn't know he was going to answer my prayer right there and then. But the presence of God came all over me. I didn't know what was going on. There was no one there to witness to me. I'm at a party. And the presence of God came all over me, and I just began to weep because I had a revelation. It was Jesus, Amen. which shocked me. Because it shocked me that my parents were right all this time. <laughs> <laughs> And I could not stop weeping for the next three days. The Spirit of God stayed on me. I would just break down throughout the day, just begin to weep, and I didn't know what was going on. But I felt so much love for the first time in my life, so much peace, uh, so much joy, and, uh, and I knew this was it. And, and then I made a final decision two weeks later at a Deep Purple concert to, to leave the drug lifestyle, throw away my drugs, and walk out of that concert during the intermission. And uh, that was the last time I did drugs. I, I believe in the 12-step program, but I like the one-step program. <laughs> I, I, I like that, boom, you're, you're delivered. Last time I did drugs, and it's been supernatural. That was on May 25th at the Friday night at the Baltimore Civic Center. Uh, 15,000 people at that Deep Purple concert. And, and I tell you, it gets gooder and gooder. Can I say that? Every day. I mean, it is just glorious. Uh, and I say this by the grace of God. I really feel this. I feel I love Jesus more today than I did when I first got saved. Yeah. Because it should be that way. You know, Proverbs 4.18 says, the path of the righteous. Um, how many know all of you are righteous before the Lord? You're the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. The path of the righteous, like the light of dawn, it shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Yeah. It doesn't diminish. But unfortunately, throughout church history, people including the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, 4, lost their first love. I mean, think about one generation after Paul established the church in Acts 19 with the greatest revival in the history of the church. Seriously, Ephesus would be the hallmark because all of Asia Minor heard the gospel from that apostolic center, which is now modern-day Turkey. All the other churches in the seven churches in Revelation was birthed out of that apostolic center. And so when you have that kind of massive revival and 40 years later, John the Apostle is still alive. I mean, we're talking about people who were with Paul, people who were still alive 
when that church was birthed, maybe some of them were with Jesus, what John the Apostle was for, for sure. And he has to write, this one thing I have against you. I mean, you're working hard. You're persevering. Uh, you discern false apostles and found them to be false. By the way, if there were false apostles, then there were also true apostles, okay? Way beyond just the 12, all right? But the point being is, is that they were discerning, they knew the word, and yet he said, you've lost your first love. But here's the good news. Repent. <laughs> Repent and do the things you did before, you know? Return to your first love. And, and so uh, I feel like that's a part of the word that God's saying to the church uh, on a macro level, globally, wherever I go, uh, because this COVID has been a divine discipline from the Lord. I really believe that. To discipline us to return to our first love. To discipline us out of the, like the church in Laodicea. So that's another church among the seven churches that came out of the Ephesus. They lost their first love, but he said to the church in Laodicea, I would rather have you hot, uh, on fire for me, or cold. At least if you don't know me, you can get to know me and become hot. But if you're lukewarm... You make me sick in my stomach. I love you, but it's just nauseous to me. Wow, what a powerful statement. I'm going to vomit you out. And so, uh, so I really believe that the Lord is coming. We are, how many know we're one day closer to the second coming than we were yesterday? And so we are uh, on this incredible, incredible time. And I'm going to make a statement that it's not hyperbole. I believe we're in the greatest time of church history. The greatest time in church history. Why? Because the Bible says it is not me, it's not some prophetic word I got from the Lord. The Bible says the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former, right? Haggai 2, verse 9. So we know as we get closer to the second coming, uh, he makes a, an oath in Numbers 14, 21. As surely as I live, and how many know God's eternal? So, you know, he's using literary language to communicate how serious he is about this. As surely as I live, the whole earth will be filled with the glory. The whole earth will be filled. So what does that mean? Does it mean some kind of Shekinah glory mist covering the globe? Because numbers, uh, I mean, not numbers, but Habakkuk 2.14, you know this one. The knowledge of the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The knowledge. So what this is implying is what Paul talks about in Colossians 1.27. Is Christ in you the hope of glory? In other words, that there are going to be so many people getting saved. that They're going to have the Holy Spirit within them. The body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The glory is going to come. They're going to know the glory. They're going to know the Holy Spirit. They're going to know God. And that's going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We're talking about flood time again. Just like Noah's time when there was a flood, just like Jesus said, the Son of Man will come just like from the days of Noah. And you can look at that as judgment as they were just wicked and every intent of their heart was on evil. And that's true. And we will see parallels. We will see the dark getting darker as Jesus comes back. And I want to talk about that. But we'll also see the glory of revival getting brighter and brighter. It's always that parallel stream. It's, it's Isaiah 60, uh, 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is upon you. Yes, darkness covers the earth, deep darkness. So there's darkness in the midst of the Lord coming upon you. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations will come to your light. So the Bible is prophesying there's going to be dark times, mad times. And uh, just there'll be pandemics, there'll be earthquakes, there'll be shaking. I'm going to shake all nations, and that's going to be the text in a moment that I want to look at. But then he says, I'm going to fill this house with glory. I'm going to bring the greatest revival. And we are going to see a billion soul harvest. And I, I say that because... Uh, I knew Bob Jones personally, and Bob Jones was a very eccentric prophet. But he got my attention when he prophesied in 1984. He said, when the Mississippi runs backwards, it will be the beginning of a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, it's crazy. Mississippi running backwards? How does the Mississippi go backwards? It goes down to New Orleans. And sure enough, in 1994, there was such amazing torrential rain that it was just 
the rain was so abundant, the flood was so abundant, the Mississippi ran backwards, and at the same time, the Holy Spirit fell in Toronto, January of 1994. And that's the kind of prophet he was. And so when he said that and the Holy Spirit came, and I got born again again at Toronto. Can I just be honest there? He was like, <laughs> even though I was a believer at 73, but in like Toronto, I got born again again. Just got so blasted by the Holy Spirit. I walked into Toronto. I left crawling out on all fours. No exaggeration. <laughs> I could not walk. I could not stand. It's not, uh, again, exaggeration. I I thank God we were in the hotel, and that's where the meetings were. So I crawled to the elevator, pushed the button, <laughs> crawled out of the elevator, opened my door on my knees, crawled, and just went to bed. That's the way I could not walk. Wow. When was the last time that happened to you, see? I mean, I mean, we, we want more, though, you know? We want, I mean, the glory with the word kavad, the Hebrew word, means weighty presence. And so when the Spirit of God comes, sometimes it just comes upon you and just falls upon you. And you just, and I've learned the more I submit to that, the more he comes. If I try to fight it and stand up and just resist, and then, of course, it sort of grieves uh, whatever is happening, you know, the, from the Holy Spirit. But if I yield, then he comes and gives more. He always wants to give you more. It's Luke 12, 32. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's not holding back. So what is the kingdom? It's not meat or drink, Romans 14, 17, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And some of you could look, you look like you could use more joy. You look like you're wearing tight underwear. I don't know what happened this morning and you got dressed. And so, <laughs> and so God wants to give you the kingdom. He's a generous heavenly father. Listen, I am a father with four adult children, they all love the Lord, all been saved since they were young and been walking with the Lord. Uh, three of them are ordained pastors. I have eight grandchildren. And half of them have come to know the Lord already. It is, I'm there having encounters with angels, you know, with Levi 6. He said, Papa, I had an encounter with an angel. I just said, what? My other grandson said, uh, Papa, when we go to uh, Hawaii, we're going to, as a family to Hawaii in August, can you baptize me in the Pacific Ocean? I mean, he initiated that. He said that. I said, absolutely. So it's great to see. My dad was a pastor. Now we're seeing four generations of believers. How many know this should be normal Christianity to a thousand generation? And I want to give you hope. If you have a prodigal, claim Acts 16.31. Acts 16.31 says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you and your family will be saved. Not might, they will be saved. It is a done deal, but you got to believe. Amen? And so that's been my prayer for my, my children and grandchildren, and they've come to know the Lord, and it's just so exciting. Again, we're in the most exciting time in church history. I believe uh, the apostles of Jesus' time long to be where we're at. And you just say, well, this has been pretty rough for me. This was my worst year. And, uh, and I understand that because in many ways it was the hardest year of my life. It wasn't just a COVID lockdown. It's not just having uh, church members who got COVID. It's not uh, just the economic uh, meltdown that we saw in California. California was the worst state out of all states. You have to understand, 49 states opened their churches for in-person service, and the only reason why we opened is because we won a lawsuit in Supreme Court. That's how long they delayed it until we won in the Supreme Court. Then they allowed us to meet. That shows you, it's a small example of how egregious it's been in California. 18,000 businesses in California declare bankruptcy. Restaurants that, it just didn't make sense. They didn't have to, they just mitigated. And here's what we did, we weren't stupid about it. We just told people, look, if you have an underlying condition, high risk, we want you to stay home and watch online. Don't come. Elderly people stay away. But the young people come. And we're going to take your temperature, you're going to wear a mask to it. You could take it off once you get to the building, but, but, uh, but we want you then to, to be adults and distance yourself. You can sit with your family, but if, you, you know, just be sensitive to the people around you. But we didn't mark seats where people can sit because I feel as adults, we are responsible. We, we understand we're, we're not stupid, but yet the spirit of stupid is upon our governor in California because they said, we don't trust you. No restaurant we trust. We're not going to let you meet at all, period. 18,000 businesses, mostly restaurants, declare bankruptcy. 
And I, I just said, what about their First Amendment rights? What about their rights to do business in this great country? And uh, what about the rights of sending your kids to school? I mean, we know that less than 1% of kids will get it, and yet we locked down the school, and uh, again, we were the last ones to open up uh, schools, and yet Newsom is sending his kids to private school, but all those schools and public school, uh, they just had to watch on Zoom. And parents who have to work, because in California it's so expensive, couldn't work. They had to stay home and monitor their kids as they're taking their lessons on the, on the Zoom call. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it was just like, it was just like madness. So it was really, really hard. So the Bible talks about this. And so the text is Haggai chapter 2, verse 7. And uh, Haggai, just a little background on Haggai. Haggai is before Zechariah, before Malachi. So just go to the end of the Bible and you can look up Haggai. But Haggai was a prophet during the time of the post-exilic period when the Jewish people were allowed to return after being in Babylon, which then was overtaken by the Persians. Uh, and Jeremiah prophesied that they would be exiled for 70 years. It, I love the Bible because these prophecies come to pass. After seven years of being exiled, they could return. And so God raised a king in Persia named Cyrus. How many of you heard of Cyrus, the king of Persia? It's in Isaiah 45, but you read about it in also Ezra chapter 1. Ezra was the scribe that wrote all this. So some of the key players would be Ezra the scribe, who actually wrote Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, Nehemiah was called Ezra, Ezra 2. So Ezra 1, Ezra 2. And according to scholars, uh, he also wrote First and Second Chronicles because the style of writing is very, very similar to Ezra and Nehemiah. And so, so he was a historian, he was a scribe, he recorded and did research and recorded, uh, and some of the earliest writings of the Bible are by Ezra. So he was a scribe. And then you have the prophets. The two prophets are Haggai and Zechariah. Of course, they don't have a king because they're now a... Um, uh, a vassal state of Persia, and uh, they have a governor, though. So Cyrus elected Zerubbabel to be the governor overseeing the return, the post exilic return, but also the rebuilding of the temple. So Cyrus makes a decree. First year of his ki uh, kingship, he says the Jewish people can return and they can build the temple. And it's amazing because the, the Bible prophesied this is going to happen, and God moves upon this pagan Persian king uh, to not only, not only give permission, but to release all the treasure that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple and return it back to the Jewish people, but even out of his royal treasury, he gives money. It's a prophetic picture of the transfer of wealth that's going to take place in the last days. Peter Wagner, the last book he wrote, my mentor, our mentor, our spiritual father, Peter Wagner, Dr. Peter Wagner, was a professor at Fuller Seminary for 30 years, and that's where I went to seminary. And, um, and so uh, he wrote 80 books, almost a book for every year of his life. He lived until he was 86, passed away in 2016, October 2016. And we really miss him. But, but the last book he wrote, uh, well, actually, there's one more book that Doris has finished, but the last book that he finished completely was A Great Transfer of Wealth, and he uses this passage as an example of a Persian king giving money, and not only that, but later on, Darius, uh, the king of Persia, gives money to help rebuild the temple. It's a picture, again, of the wealth of the unrighteous coming to the righteous. Now, I want you to be in faith. I want you to believe God for this kind of transfer of wealth, and that, because here's the reason why it takes money to fulfill the Great Commission. It takes money to feed the poor, what you're doing. It takes money to renovate this building. And God in his sovereignty have chosen this to, uh, from the very beginning, to build the temple. It took money to build the temple. All right? So now Haggai then is a fundraising letter. It's only two chapters. And the reason why it's a fundraising letter is because when Cyrus gave the decree, he dies. And then a new king becomes king of Persia. His name is Artaxerxes. He receives an evil report that Jewish people are rebellious and they're going to rebel. And so he tells the people they can't build anymore. They can't build anymore. 18 years of a pause. So they can't work on the, until Artaxerxes dies. And then the temple 
under Darius is, is uh, now given permission to rebuild. And Haggai's living during this time, and he's trying to raise money and tell the people. Now, these people have moved now, so they're living in Jerusalem. And so Haggai begins by saying, you're living in your panel houses. You've had time to build your houses because there was no, uh, you know, there was no, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lockdown that you couldn't build. You can build your house, but the temple is not finished. So bring down wood and finish the temple. And, and, and he was trying to get them to raise the money. And so he says this. So this is the verse. This is our text, Haggai 2, 7. I'm going to shake all nations. They will come with the wealth of the nations, and I will fill this house with glory. Wow. The next verse says, the silver is mine, my, the gold is mine. And then the last verse, verse 9, Haggai 2, 9. The glory of the latter house will be more glorious than the house, former house. And so, so here we are. I'm going to shake all nations. Now, during that time, Haggai, again, you've got to understand, how is he prophesying this in his context? And what he was thinking about is the Persian nations. I'm going to shake the Persian nations because what happened was is that the nations that were involved that conspired against them were the Samaritans in Israel that gave an evil report that these are rebellious people, and then Artaxerxes. It, it, you know, and can I just say this? Not to, not to make anything sound too parallel, but it's just like we had President Trump who moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, who was pro-Israel, pro-life, by the way, and all these wonderful things, and then all of a sudden we get a new administration that's just the opposite. So that's what happened in that time period. You had Cyrus who blessed the people to build the temple, then Artaxerxes, he stops it. But then, how many know we will have a new administration eventually? Come on. And so then Darius becomes king, and he says, he looks at the record and said, oh my goodness, Cyrus made a decree. You can't change the decree of a president or a king. And so he says they have to rebuild it and finish building. And so they got, the, they got the permission, but Haggai's trying to raise money now. And he says God's going to shake the nations. And just like they, he brought the wealth of the nations the first time, he's going to bring money again to help us finish. But as you know, when it comes to prophecy, there's three things that we need to really understand. One is revelation. Number two is the interpretation. You could get a word, but there has to be proper interpretation. There has to be the prophetic even to interpret that revelation. And third, there has to be the proper application. A lot of us, we get words, but we don't interpret it correctly, and that's where we miss it, and we wonder why this word didn't come to pass. How many have prophetic words you receive that's yet to come to pass? Well, it may be that you need to go back over your journal. I don't know about you, but I write down my dreams and my prophecy. I have a prayer journal. Uh, that um, I carry with me wherever I go. And, uh, and I write down, because over the years, uh, you, you know, we, we forget. And uh, the ink is, is, is stronger than the, the greatest memory. And so we need to record. And so anyway, uh, so just getting the proper interpretation. Now, here's my take on what the interpretation is. I don't think Haggai... Even though he got the word that God's going to shake the nations, he was referring to Persia, he was referring to what was going on in Israel. But I think he was prophesying to our period. 2,500 years. By the way, this took place 500 years before Jesus was born. And the temple was uh, started in 528 B.C., 18 year Paul's, and now it's around you know, 510. They're, they're trying to finish building the temple. And so he's prophesied. Why am I saying that? Because in 2,000 years since Jesus came, only twice have we seen every nation shaken. So think about it. When did we see every nation shaken? In the last 2,000 years. Well, let me give it to you because I know you're thinking about, well, we've had the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. We had the Crusades and all that. But China wasn't shaken then. It didn't impact India. The two times we've seen happen in World War II where 195 nations were involved in the war. I don't know if you knew that. In World War II, every nation had to align themselves either with the Allied forces, with the United States, England, 
and Soviet Union or the Axis forces, Germany, Hitler Germany, Japan, and Italy. Only seven nations were neutral, like Switzerland and Sweden. Everyone else had to align, and everyone was impacted economically by the war, and it was the most devastating war where 80 million people died in World War II. We have a little over 2 million with COVID internationally, but, but we're talking about 80 million. By the way, 80% of those were civilians. There wasn't soldiers. I mean, I go to Russia. We have uh, around 150 churches in, in um, Russia in our network. Most of the pastors grew up orphans because they're, you know, of my generation. Their dads died or their grandfathers died. It's an orphan nation. And so many people died. And, and, and by the way, the ones that survived end up becoming alcoholics because vodka is just $1 a bottle compared to, it's cheaper than beer. And the whole nation became a nation of alcoholics. I have so many pastor friends who have lost limbs because they were drunk in the freezing Siberian weather and they got frostbite and they lost fingers and limbs. You know, I mean, seriously, because when you greet them, they give you a hug, but you can't shake their hand because they have no hand. And so you see this situation when you travel around the world and you just say, oh my goodness, they are an orphan nation because of the devastation of World War II. And so I know we, we are a different generation, but that's why Brokaw said the greatest generation was the World War II generation. What they did to give us the freedom that we have, I, we need to thank the armed forces. We need to thank our soldiers. So that's the first time. But the second time is COVID. Every nation, 200 nations, has been impacted by this coronavirus, COVID-19. And so when Haggai is prophesying, God says, I'm going to shake all nations. It never happened in 2,000 years. It, you could say, well, it was just, you know, literary language that he's going to shake some nations. No, I believe all means all in the Bible. He's talking about our period because he's talking about the glory of the latter house being the greatest glory coming. It's all in the context of glory and revival. So in the midst of the shaking and darkness, God's prophesying and promising us the greatest revival in church history, the greatest revival. So I'm here to encourage you. Yes, it's been dark with COVID. Yes, it's been dark with lost businesses. Yes, it's been dark with domestic violence and, and child abuse and Suicide, I mean, in California, people, have, they have making, uh, they're committing suicide left and right, but they're doing it through drug overdose. That's their choice of how they want to kill themselves. And I was talking to Shannon Grove, who is our Senate minority leader. We have 40 senators in Sacramento, 31 are Democrats, only nine are Republicans, and she's a leader of the nine Republicans. And she said, as soon as COVID hit, is that the, the hotline for suicide was off the charts. You know, people are already, you know, I mean, suicide is the number two killer among teenagers. First of all, for those who don't know, number one is accidents caused by car accidents, uh, death through car accident. But number two is suicide. So in the midst of this lockdown, it just was off the charts. And so what about those deaths, you know? I mean, that's, that's why I'm just saying it's like, okay, you're counting the COVID. And, and, and here's my take. Even though it's tragic, any life, I'm a pro-life pastor. Can I hear an amen? I'm a pro -life. I, I started uh, this pro-life movement called One Race for Life uh, to get young people to pledge to vote with uh, a biblical uh, conviction and vote for pro-life candidates. But people, when I sued the governor and we opened up, the press was all over me. They were like white on rice. They, they, they called me a super spreader. They called me a selfish pastor. They called me, I said, how could you love people and kill your people at the same time? That's what they're saying. You talk about slander. The media has gone just out of control. There, there's just not, there's no even tact or politeness. There's just no, you know, just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, but who cares? You're a super spreader. You're killing your people. You're a selfish pastor. That's what I was getting. And I had to, not to defend myself, I said, no, I love my people. 
But I'm not just concerned about their physical well-being. I'm concerned about their spiritual well-being. I believe in a hell, and I believe in a heaven, and I want to see people go to heaven. I'm concerned about their emotional well-being, their mental well-being. I don't want to see them depressed. They need to come to be in the presence of God. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. But it just goes right over them because Satan has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says Satan has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. They just don't see. We have come to the time where Isaiah says in Isaiah 5, 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, darkness light, light darkness. So they said, so Newsom, he, he, he still thinks he's a hero. I saved so many lives. But he's not talking about all the deaths through suicide. And the people who did die, a lot of it was not COVID, it was cancer, but then they got COVID. And, you know, it's like they just, anything that had to do with COVID, they would rack it up as a COVID death. And so the numbers have greatly grad, uh, uh, but here's the thing, it's still shaking. It's still shaking, especially because of these egregious uh, leaders who made it worse than it should have been. And so we all suffer because of bad leadership. But in the midst of this, God says, I know. I know you're going through a hard time, but I want to promise you in the midst of the shaking, two things are going to happen. They're going to bring the wealth to the nations. We had an example of that, because when we won the lawsuit, not only did we win the lawsuit, we won a settlement for $1.35 million, million dollars. We already got the check. It is amazing. That's a small microcosm of the macro of God bringing the wealth of the nations. You know, I mean, it's like, he, 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 anyway, it, it's just been amazing. In the midst of this darkness and shaking, we're prospering. Yeah. Our church is the largest it's ever been because people are checking us out because they want to know who's this crazy pastor that opened up the church and sued Governor Newsom. I mean, unbelievers are coming every week and they're getting saved. Yeah. We, we opened four different campuses uh, in, um, in, during the covid in Orange County, Riverside County, in Sacramento. I mean, we have, you know, we've grown the largest during this time because we, and I prophesy that's going to happen to you because you guys opened as well. I mean that. You know, what we need is we need courageous leadership like never before. You know, the word in 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. But that word fear is not the normal Greek word fear, which is Phobos is a Greek word, phobos. We get the word phobia from. And you see that everywhere, like fear not, is always phobos, the Greek word. That Greek word is very rare in 2 Timothy 1. Only appears two times in the New Testament. Once there and also in Revelation 21. The word is actually dylea. It's the Greek word dylea. We translate that cowardice, being a coward. And in Revelation 21, it says, I'm going to throw the cowards, the murderers, the adulterers into the lake of fire. That's how strongly he feels about being a coward. He says, I haven't given you a spirit of being a coward. I've given you power of the Holy Spirit. I've given you love. Perfect love casts out any kind of fear and a sound mind. You need to take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Look, we are in a warfare but we're fighting against speculations and every vain thing raised up against the true knowledge of God. We need the truth. We've been fed lies by the media. And so you got to guard yourself. I can't even watch the news anymore. I don't watch the news, except for Newsmax and OAN and just a few, you know. Epoch Times, I read that every day. But, but I can't because it's just all lies. And, I, and see... Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal, not the removal, but the renewal. Some of you just checked out. You're not thinking for yourself. You got to get your minds renewed. And I'm serious about this. I'm saying this as, as your brother in Jesus. Look, you got to be transformed because we're living the most exciting time. You need to be equipped for the greatest adventure, the greatest revival, the greatest. He's going to use every one of you. Because when he says, I'm going to fill this house with glory, what's he talking about? Now, Haggai, when he was prophesying this, he was thinking about the temple once it's built. Remember when Solomon built his temple before it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C.? Wiped it out. 
So this temple, he said, in 2 Chronicles 5, when Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory came in. The 120 priests, which I think is an interesting number, just like in the upper room, could not stand because the glory came and they were on their faces. The Shekinah glory. So he says the glory of the latter house, this house, is going to be greater than the glory of Solomon's house. He's prophesying. But again, if you don't get the right interpretation, you're going to say he was a false prophet. You know, I've had so many pastors repent for, I mean, these guys who are prophet friends of mine, they were prophesying that Trump's going to win, and, and they start to apologize because they were under so much pressure from the body of Christ that it was a false prophecy. And I tell them, why are you apologizing? I call them, I, I, I don't feel you missed it. I feel it was stolen. And so there's, there are people who choose, but you didn't prophesy he should have won. And so, so here's the point, though. In this situation, he was saying the glory is going to be greater. And we read about in Ezra chapter 6, because Ezra chronicles the dedication of the finished temple under Darius, a new king, and under Haggai and Zechariah. And there was no glory. No glory came. So was he missing it? No. He was prophesying to our time. The glory. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, also in 6.19, don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Tell the person next to you, don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit dwells within you. The glory is in you. And has been for the last 2,000 years who was prophesying Pentecost. He didn't even know it. See, when it comes to the prophetic, it's, again, it's somewhat of a mystery because you're caught up in the Spirit and you're hearing from God and you record what God tells you. But again, you could interpret it as, oh, well, this temple is going to be amazing, you know. But he was actually thinking about our period where we're, we're the carriers of glory. Every one of you are carriers of the glory. Every one of you. I don't have more glory than you. We, are, we have Christ in us. How many of you are born again? I mean, unless you're not born again. If you're born again, is Christ in you the hope of glory? In other words, you're, you carry the hope for this world. You carry the hope and the answer for society. And so that's why he is raising up an army in the last days. And it's not just going to be a few handful of evangelists. Look, our job is to equip the saints for the work of what? You're the ministers. The Bible says you're all kings and priests. Revelation 1.6. I like the way it says in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a royal priesthood. Again, royalty and priests. Now you have to understand this from, from uh, an Old Testament perspective, what that means. In the Old Testament, the king was not the highest person in Israel society. The number one person was a prophet. The number two was the king and then was the priest. That was the order of authority. The prophet was over the king. That's why, for example, it was Samuel who picked Saul, anointed him. It was Samuel who said, the kingdom is taken from you and it's going to be given to a man after my heart. And he picked David. It was a prophet named Nathan who said to David, you are that man that has taken that uh, that little you, and, and you took Bathsheba and committed adultery, and, uh, and David repented right before the prophet, I've sinned before the Lord. Thank God he did. So that's why Haggai is so important. Haggai and Zechariah, they carried so much authority. Zerubbabel was under Haggai. But here's what God says. We know that Jesus is the prophet. He is the apostle. But he says, you're my kings and my priests. I made you kings and priests. Come on. That means you have tremendous authority. Yeah, we're not Jesus, but we are to be like him. We're Christ-like ones. We're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. And, and so the devil will do two things. First of all, he'll just, you know, not reveal who God is, the nature and character of God. That's why Paul said at the end of his life, I want to know him more and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, right? But the second thing the devil will do is to lie to you who you are in Christ Jesus, your identity in Christ. Because once he knows that you know who you are, you're unstoppable. 
You're going to be bold as a lion. The righteous are bold as a lion. Do you know you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? See, I think the problem is, is that we don't know. And unfortunately, and again, the, the problems with the church because we've dumbed down the gospel. We made it so secret sensitive that we just want to, you know, it's like we, we, we've ignored the Ten Commandments and we've just adopted the Eleventh Commandment. The Eleventh Commandment is be nice. <laughs> Just be nice. Just don't make cause waves. Do not, you know, ruffle any feathers. But what about thou shalt not commit adultery or homosexuality? How about thou shalt not murder? How about abortion? No pastor will speak the truth in love. I'm not talking about being harsh. But we just don't talk about it. But Jesus said, until heaven and earth pass away, not a small little dot will be taken from the law. I came not just to... I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. I am the law. And my standards are even higher because I'm going to now give you grace because I'm going to do something that Jeremiah 31 says. I am going to put my law within you. And I'm going to write it on the tablet of your heart. Ezekiel 26 says I'm going to take the rock, the stony heart, and give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit. And all of a sudden there's grace. Are you kidding me? For me to give up drugs in one day? How many know that's the grace of God? There's no willpower. There's no, you know, uh, psychological counseling that's going to do that. But the grace of God. So have you tapped into the grace of God? And so how do we receive the grace? He gives grace to the humble. And you have to just come to an end to yourself where you just say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need your grace and help in a time of need. I've done my own thing and I made a mess and I keep on, you know, thinking that, you see, humanism is putting yourself ahead of God. That's an ideology, it's a religion. And that's the foundation of Marxism and socialism is that man is worship, is Kim Jong-un, his worship, not the people worshiping God and Jesus Christ. And that's where all the demonic, I mean, look at, when you take God out of the equation, like in communism, because they don't believe in God, then we're not made in the image and likeness of God and life is cheap. The human rights against people is absolutely an abomination. We're talking about just Stalin, Mao, and Popal killed 100 million of their own people. Just mass starvation, mass killing, the killing fields, sending people to the Gulag prison in Siberia. Because why? Because people are not made in the image of God. And I am God. I'm going to call the shots. And it's just so, it's so demonic. And the reason why I'm saying this is because that spirit is coming to America. I'm experiencing it in California. That socialism, totalitarianism, Marxism is coming. We're now, the critical race theory in our, manifesting in our schools in uh, California is that we're now teaching kids to chant to Aztec gods so that we could appreciate the diversity of the Mexican history of the Mexicans in Southern California. It's demonic chants. I was meant telling you just the chant that I did was demonic, but that's, that's now been passed. I mean, it's just crazy. Last year, we had a gay senator, Democrat, from San Francisco passed a bill that went through the House, the Senate, and Newsom signed, legalizing being a pederast, that the age now you could have sex with a boy is 16 years old. It's madness. That got approved. And now the Equality Act that the Senate is just on a pause, they're trying to pass, that's the same bill that we, California, passed on a state level. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If that Equality Act is passed, we're talking about 40 of the most deviant sexual behavior will become legal in this country. We just had my, my attorney friend who's part of the board of Revive California, which is a new organization that got birthed out of this... Uh, after election, it's a 501c4 organization. We're raising money to support conservative believers who are running for office. And so, uh, but he represented a Christian woman who was at We Spa, Women's Spa, Women and Children, girls can go to this spa. And this transgender man came into that spa absolutely naked. This narcissistic plant, he wasn't, he wasn't a transgender. It was just fun. This is the problem. All you have to say is I'm transgender and it's legal in California. You could, uh, you could go to this woman's spa. 
And it's just so, this is crazy. What we would call a few years ago indecent exposure and he would be arrested for, we're saying it's okay now that you are a transgender. This is madness. And so the Bible says in the last days, there's going to be madness. There's going to be darkness. Darkness is going to cover the earth. But the Lord says, arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is going to be seen upon you. You're going to be the ones to carry that glory. And the way you're going to carry that glory is by sharing the gospel. We've got to speak the truth in love. We've got to let people know. We've got to come out of the closet and let people know we're believers and followers of Jesus. It's amazing. You know, everyone else is coming out of the closet, and yeah, we're still in the closet, and, and our churches are in the closet, and we won't even tell, you know, what the standards of what the Bible says because we're too nice. We don't want to offend people. Nonsense. It's the ecclesia. I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell, no matter what they throw at us, will not prevail against the church. Come on. Let's all stand up. And I love preaching here because you guys are... Not woke, but you're awakened. You, are, you guys are just revived. And it's fun because there are places I go and I said, oh, Lord, please have mercy upon us as a church. Seriously, there's a reflection on your great pastors. And so what I do want to do, though, is that I want us to receive more glory. And uh, he says, how much more would the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? See, we're to be continually filled. And that's why it says in Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, but be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It says be filled, but in the Greek it's a continual present tense. The way it's translated is be continually filled. Just like, you know, I need water all the time, right? You can't say I had water three days ago. I mean, you couldn't even talk three days later because you'd be so dehydrated. And so how, how does the Holy Spirit come? Here's, here's the scripture for you. Acts 6.32 says this. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. It's so simple. He never promises the Holy Spirit without repentance first. Repent that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent and then afterwards I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Job 2, 12 and verse 28. Repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we see the principle of obedience and consecration how many of you want more of the Holy Spirit? Are you hungry for more? You want more of the glory? Well, you know, I, I shared with you how I gave my life in 73, but I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 74 when I was at a youth group. Evangelical, they didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. The pastor was a graduate, a graduate of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. He was a cessationist. He dispensationalist, didn't believe in the gifts. Preached the, the word. He was a great guy. But he taught that the gifts were not for today. Healing is not for today. So I didn't know. I was just there because it was a church that gave an invitation after Sunday for salvation like Billy Graham. So that's why I went there. But in this youth group, and back in 74, we were singing songs like from the gospel musical, Day by Day, and uh, Pass It On. It's just songs that, you know, we look back on it. But this song was very powerful because the words were to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly day by day. So we sang it all the time, but this time I was just really consecrating myself. I said, Lord, I really want to see you. I really want to love you with all my heart, and I want to follow you with all my heart. And the best of my, and all of a sudden my feet start to vibrate. It was like, I felt like I had walked onto some kind of a uh, pad with electricity, and the electricity was shooting up my legs, shooting up my body. I felt like my hair was on the edges. It wasn't. But then it went down my arms, and seriously, no hyperbole, I could not close my hand to make a fist. I could not. The tingling had caused me to just, you know, my, my fingers were just spread out. I could not close it. I'm trying. I'm experiencing. I didn't know what was going on. And at the same time, I'm feeling liquid love come over me, and I'm wailing and weeping. And I was making such a scene during the worship service, my youth pastor tapped me on the shoulder and said, whatever's happened to you, just take it to the men's room. <laughs> and so he dismissed me because I was wailing. And I didn't care, I was just caught up in the spirit. But it was because I consecrated myself that I got baptized and I've been experiencing that ever since. So would you pray this with me? And I want you to pray this, but make this your prayer. Just say, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all my sins. 
I truly repent. I give you my whole life. All of me. Be the Lord of my life. And give me your grace to love you, to follow you, to obey you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me afresh. Give me your power so I could be a laid down lover for you. I'll receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Just breathe it and just receive it by faith. Just receive the Holy Spirit. Now let the Spirit of God come upon you and just rest upon you. Come, Holy Spirit, more. Just wait on the Holy Spirit. One thing I love about John Wimber, I was a vineyard pastor for one year. He just loved to just wait on the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit started to move and touch. He was never in a hurry, you know. The worship be an hour, preaching an hour, and then the ministry to <laughs> would just go on and on and just the Spirit of God would just fall. Now I already see the Spirit of God falling on some of you. It's amazing. I just see it and it's just a just doing this for 40 some years. And some of you are just feeling a light presence coming upon you. Some are starting to shake, tingle. Some of you are starting to weep. But I say more Lord, whatever is happening. More Holy Spirit. Just just ask for more, Lord, more, Lord. And just, again, when you start feeling it, just yield yourself more to him. Just say, Lord, I give you all of me. Consecrate. I don't care if you looked at porn last night, there's no condemnation. The righteous fall seven times, but they get right back up again. That's it. I don't care what you did. Even five minutes before you came to a church building, you maybe got in an argument with your spouse. doesn't matter. There's now no condemnation. You're making a fresh consecration right now. Now receive the power of the Holy Spirit more. It's falling on the balcony. It's falling on the front row here. Now here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you, just be honest before the Lord, but if you are feeling the Spirit of God on you, a tingling sensation, a manifestation different for each person, some cry, that's a manifestation. Some laugh, that's a manifestation. Some start to shake. Some just feeling this extraordinary peace, but you know the Spirit's resting on you. If that is you, I'm going to ask you to come out of your seat and come up to the front, and I just want to bless what the Father's doing. Just come on up. From the balcony, make your way down, please. Just spread yourself out throughout from that, that door down here. And if you're saying, I don't feel anything, just keep on soaking. It's okay, because you're receiving. One of the things that I love about Paul, he says in Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. We live by faith and not by sight, not by what we feel. So you're receiving, just receive by faith. You're too great. So Lord Moore, we thank you. We bless what you're doing. Now I'm going to ask some of the men to just follow me because I just want to lightly just touch and bless what the Father's doing and just going down first row, second row, etc. And just to make sure this is a safe place, I need some ushers to help me out here. Can we have the uh, organist or pianist up here and just play some worship? Okay, great. Thank you. Just play a little bit louder. And, and just keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Worship the Lord. And I'm just going to come around and just lay hands. Mm -hmm. 